The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. I'm a really sickly sounding Jackson, but don't worry, it's not for the full episode. Now today, in this episode, we are speaking to Dr. Simon Elliott, all about his brand new book with pen and sword, Great Battles of the Early Roman Empire. This is a great book, and Simon and I discuss the different effects, context, and, and causes of three of the battles that he describes in his book. It's a really great episode, and I know that you're going to enjoy it. Now, if you enjoy this episode or any of the other content that we create here at History of Jackson, please do consider donating via the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below, or subscribing via History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. Now, in the meantime, I'll leave you with Simon. So, hello, and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. Today, we welcome back historian, author, and great friend of the podcast, Dr. Simon Elliott, to talk about his brand new book, which I have just received today, Great Battles of the Early Roman Empire, which I must say has probably got one of the best covers I've seen in recent times. But how are you doing, Simon? Doing really, really well. Lovely to be back on the on, on the pod, Jackson. Thank you for having me, mate. That's all right, mate. I always enjoy talking to you about Rome and loads of different things about Rome because we've discussed so much personally and on the podcast. So, but first question I want to ask you, Simon, and I ask you this every time, what was the inspira- inspiration behind writing this book? Um it's basically just uh, on the back of all the all my various other books. I mean, this isn't like my nineteenth book. I think um, in the past few years, I think actually my first book came out in twenty sixteen, and since then there are nineteen out. And actually, a lot of my writing on the Roman world is about the Roman military or political and economic history. And in, in every book I've written, I cover battles here and I cover battles there. And I actually, thought you know what, you've not written Simon a book about Roman battles. And actually, if I'm being really, really, really honest, actually, for me writing a book about, uh, without diminishing the book, it's like a busman's holiday for me because (laughs) I love Roman history. As you know, uh, I'm a war gamer. I'm still the president of the Society of Ancients as I speak and playing toy soldiers tonight with some Gauls and I'm playing toy soldiers tomorrow with some Romans against some some Pontic, Mithridatic Pontic troops. Um, so, so I almost lived my life through the Roman through Roman military history. So suddenly, I find myself thinking to myself, you know what? Why don't you just pick your favourite Roman battles? Now that's difficult, Jackson, because there are a lot. The Roman Empire lasted from twenty seven BC through to let's say AD four seventy six in the West, and then the um, Roman Republic lasted from five hundred nine BC to twenty seven BC. So that's a long period of time. That's a lot of battles. So I figured I'd chunk it. So I've initially gone for this this chunk, which is the first half of the Roman Empire, early Imperial Rome. So this is the phase we call the Principate phase, uh, when the Roman Empire was at its height, when it was always moving forward. More often than not, it won. And if it lost, it learned from it and then won. So the moving forward bit. I, I quite like the... You've- just put your favorite stuff in there i think that's a great thing about being a historian is that you do get to investigate what you want to do but you've mentioned a great point there i think that's a really good segue to my next question is i find it really interesting that in this book you've not just included stories about rome's victories you know we all know that rome was this great military power and it won loads of battles but you've also chosen to tell tales of defeat why why have you chosen to include defeats in there i know you said they're your favorite battles but you know, including defeats is going against that popular narrative of Rome. It's because it helps me explain my view of what made the Roman Empire different from other empires, other political systems uh, of the past, especially in its in, in its own time. And that is a couple of things. Number one, um, I think the Romans had, just within their own culture, something which we will call today true grit. So so they didn't give in. They knew they wouldn't always win, but they were exceptionally resilient as a people, as a culture and a political system. And therefore, on the occasions when they lost, they always came back. And more often than not, when they did, ultimately won on their own terms. Very rarely did the Romans accept a peace at the end of a war, not on their own terms. They were relentless. 
So that's true grit. And secondly, it also enables me to show a, a second propensity of the Romans, particularly in the imperial period, which is the ability to nick other people's ideas in terms of technology and tactics. So as an example, if you look at the the, the, the Principate, early Principate legionary of the time of the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, AD 9, where Varus loses his three legions, which is my first battle, big chapter in the book, actually, big, big punching start to the book. Um, although we found evidence physically that mo- a lot of Roman soldiers were wearing new types of armor, like Lorica Segmentata, Banded Iron Armor, many of them were still being wearing chain mail. So we use that as our blueprint. That particular Roman legion who was wearing an imperial Gallic helmet, so the clues in the name, it's an idea originally nicked from the Gauls. He was wearing Lorica Hamata chain mail, if it wasn't, Lorica segmentata. The chain mail uh, is also nicked from the Gauls. Um, he was carrying a couple of Pelham javelins, which were almost certainly Spanish in origin. He was carrying a, a Gladius Hispaniensis, the clues in the name. The Gladius is originally a Spanish sword. Um, and he's got a Scutum shield, which is almost certainly from the Samnites, who are a people the Romans fought in Italy earlier. So every piece of technology that he's wearing as a Roman legionary is nicked. And all the technology translates the tactics or the tactics they used the roman legionary with this gladius and spaniens and the pillum was actually a swordsman the pillum was secondary weapons he was actually um uh, he had a very set tra- of fighting technique with the gladius spaniensis that was all developed from the ideas of other people so they're the two things the romans had grit and the ability to nick other people's ideas without worrying about it and then turn them to their own benefit which i can show through their losses to show how through the losses they ultimately won the wars and when when you're talking about those battles that they lose it's really nice that you start to detail how rome reacted and what rome did to kind of improve itself but also go back at that opposition but you talked about teutonberg forest there i actually wanted to touch on teutonberg because it's such an important and incredibly interesting battle and you've given us some small details but i wanted to just quickly look at you know what was the germanic and i think as you mentioned in your book germanic is probably slightly problematic term but what were the germanic armies and and troops like that the romans were about to to encounter at the battle of teutonberg the, the roman primary sources describe them as being like the gauls but better so so the romans all almost at this stage portray the gauls who are now part of the roman empire as being almost effeminate to the, simply because the Romans conquered them in eight years um, and then gradually incorporated them as, into the Roman Roman Republic as a province and then later empire. So Gaul was part of Rome by this point. Um, so so the, the Roman primary source to describe the Germans as like the Gauls but better, sort of tall, fierce, um, very good in the charge, um, not particularly good at, at lasting long in battle. So if you could withstand the initial charge, you'd be okay. Um I, I actually think in terms of the Teutoburg Forest, you can see Augustus in particular completely underestimating the nature of his opponent, though, because Augustus was looking at – Augustus uh, uh, reformed the – created the Roman Empire, reformed the, the provinces of the Roman Empire into the Principate provinces of the Roman Empire, reformed the Roman military, pushed the boundaries of the Roman Empire, created new provinces, and he thought he could create a new province in Germania fairly easily in the same way that uh, Caesar had conquered Gaul. So actually, if you look at Varus, who he put in charge uh, of the um, of, of, of um, pacifying Germania, as he called it, Varus was an administrator, not a soldier. He was a very, very good administrator, actually. So you can see Augustus's thought process that um, the Germans will roll over quite quickly. I chuck a few legions in there, and once the legions have done their job, and why wouldn't they? Uh, Varus then can roll up and then create a new province, and then ultimately all the money starts coming in. The Romans had provinces not because it was nice, because it was to make money. They wanted to rinse all of their provinces dry financially, so all the money went into the imperial fiscus treasury of the emperor. And that's what Augustus thought was going to happen in Germania. And it didn't completely underestimated his opponent. And of course, in terms of his opponent, you have Arminius, who actually is is, is um, the son of a German tribal king who is actually now uh, commanding troops in the Roman army, having been a hostage, etc. Uh, he's there as a sort of like um, a rogue element the Romans didn't know about, actually, until it was way too late in the day. Whether that's true or not, by the way, we don't know. It's always worth remembering here, everything we know about the Romans is from their own perspective. Everything. We've got no idea 
what the Germans thought. We've got no idea how they viewed the engagement because there's no narrative. There's no written record of it. If there had been, the Romans would have got rid of it. But in the Germans' case, there wasn't anywhere, I don't think. So so basically, we see everything through the Romans' eyes. And so obviously, they portray the reason why Varus loses his three legions and it drives Augustus to distraction because you have this guy, the turncoat, Arminius, blindsiding the Romans. And I like, I like that point about Rome being that, the victor who writes their history, because it gives you such a different perspective, which I think you lack not having the German side. But Arminius is really, really interested in that battle and being a turncoat. But you mentioned something about provinces and, and Rome trying to gain money from these provinces. Why was Germania so attractive for the Romans? I think it's because, well, I think raw materials, basically, I think it's, well, two things, actually. Two things, actually. One, Augustus was clearly a very, very, very ambitious individual, incredibly so in actual fact, to do the achievements that he did. Within the world in which he lived, his achievements were incredible. And I think there was a political incentive from his perspective that, you know, if he could conquer Germania, that's something, you know, Caesar conquered Gaul, I've done Germania. And it's worth remembering, Jackson, in the Roman world, Augustus was the greatest Roman, Caesar wasn't. So later in the Roman Empire, when you have emperors, um, senior and junior, the senior one is called the Augustus and the junior one is called the Caesar. It's very important to remember that. It's completely the flip side to our world today where Caesar is the best known and most famous Roman. Um, so I think Augustus wanted to emulate Caesar in doing his own conquests as a political incentive. But more than that, there's a huge amount of resources in Northern Europe. You know, you're looking at accessing the, the Scandinavian trade in the Baltic. Um, uh, the Romans are going towards the Elbe, etc. You know, you'd be, you're really beginning to get into these long range trading networks, giving you access to the Baltic. You've got all these incredible forests with amazing wood. And remember, most of the Roman world, although a lot of it was stone built, most wasn't. It was built from wood. As as in much of the pre modern world, uh, and also all the all the metal raw materials and everything else as well, and agricultural land. So basically, it's raw materials with political uh, political capital for Augustus on top. I mean, you can see why he wants that political capital to to defeat someone that they think is a, a dangerous enemy and a very powerful, skilled enemy as well. But I've, you know, we're looking at the battle. I think the battle's the interesting part here. You know, you, in your book, you've broken it down into three phases which I, th- I thought was yeah. a really interesting way to, an easy way to understand the battle. What were these these three phases and how did they, they kind of play out? Uh, the first one is the, well, basically you, you've got three legions and an equivalent number of auxiliaries. So a Roman legionary of this period is 5,500 men. So you've got over 16,000 legionaries and an equivalent number of auxiliaries, foot and mounted. So it's over 30,000 men. So they're in a column walking through fairly narrow defiles along long roadways. The Romans themselves have cut through the forests, always or usually along with one flank covered by a waterway, so the baggage trains on the water. Uh, that's what they're using to penetrate the German forests. Um, but you're talking about a column about 16 kilometres long. So the first phase is the Roman penetration going in and then suddenly realising actually uh, – they're trying to force some Varus is trying to force a meeting engagement, so he thinks that one battle will sort it, and then he can set up his uh, province of Germania. But he realizes ultimately that the Germans aren't going to fight him. Probably guerrilla warfare all the way, not enough to actually worry him too much. So he turns round. So the first phase is actually as he turns round, and then he begins his withdrawal. Second phase is the big ambush, where Arminius has actually got an ambush and forces this column down a specific route the third phase is where there's a final ambush and it's the final ambush where the roman column comes against field defenses which block their way and you can just tell and and this is what is now beginning to emerge in the archaeological record where that last ambush took place well actually the whole lot there's a there is a 16 kilometer long battlefield debris trail now well known leading to cal crazy hill and then Cal Crazy is where the final ambush took place, and where the, where you can see there are Roman skeletons, people trying to Romans, including dragging dragging mules, actually carrying probably wounded, over these German field defences, with the skeletons then just dropping down the other side where they died. So the penetration the, and the withdrawal, the first ambush and the second ambush. I know we don't have a lot of evidence for this, but how brutal is that? Is that final ambush for the Romans? The whole lot's brutal, actually, because. Um, you're talking about a clash of cultures here where the Romans fight. Well, the Romans basically dehumanised anybody that uh, was not Roman, full stop. 
uh, anybody who was north of the the the, the, the Limes, uh, the frontier, and on the Rhine and Danube, they were barbarians uh, who were completely dehumanized. Um, so that so it's brutal from the Roman perspective. You know, the Romans thought nothing of slotting any any captives they got if it would prove a point for them. They they would carry out a genocide against populations who rebelled against them. So so the Romans did dehumanize their opponents. So that's brutal on the Roman side. Germans Germans are fighting for survival with nothing to lose, and in their own territory that they know, they know well um, against a, an opponent that they know dehumanizes them, and they in turn dehumanize the Romans. So it's the worst kind of conflict with no quarter given either side, and it's as brutal as you can think. The fate of a lot of the and again it's from the Roman narrative, remember, but the fate of the Roman the prisoners who were caught, according to Roman contemporary authors, was uh, too gruesome to describe on a popular podcast. Jackson, <laughs> lots of stakes and spikes involved. Well, I think we can only imagine, really. But that, that, coming across that archaeological evidence of that must be gruesome just looking at that as well without even having what was there. And then, then it's interesting, I'm going to touch on it in the conclusion as well, Jackson, that um, from a Roman perspective, this is such a terrible, terrible defeat. Uh, it's so embarrassing for all concerned that actually it plays out throughout the rest of Roman history is always there. It's like Cana, uh, the defeat at Cana in the Second Punic War when Hannibal annihilated the Romans, the second big battle of Hannibal's invasion of Italy. You know, it's one of those battles which, and it's like Adrianople in the later dominate phase of empire. I actually mentioned the three in link, linked almost in the, the the big Roman defeat. Could have been Alia when the Gauls defeated um, the Romans and sacked Rome uh, in the 5th century. I don't think it was that. I think it was Cana, which was the big Roman defeat in the Republic. And then you have Teutoburg Forest in the Principate, and then in the Dominate, you've got Adrianople. They're three defeats the Romans sit on the Roman psych forever. So all those other battles I've got, every all the other seven after Teutoburg Forest in the book, there's a thread going through about the Romans not wanting to lose again to that level. Every Roman commander had it in, in, in the back of their mind, oh my God, I can't lose like Varus did in Teutoburg Forest. It's always sitting there. It's interesting to see that that play out across a national is not a big enough word, but like a, a na- national psyche and, a, and a, an institutional thought of I can't do that. But what was and, we, and you've discussed the Roman response often being to learn and to go back. How did the Romans learn, and what was the the effect of them going back? There was well, well, firstly, when they went back, they went back. It's interesting, actually, when um, Tiberius goes back, Tiberius actually is very cautious and he has a council of advisors around him when he leads the first punitive expeditions afterwards, which are all very successful, by the way. So from that point, the Romans keep winning and eventually Varus dies, not at the hands of the Romans, at the Germans. Um, so um, the Romans actually do learn the lessons. They know now how to campaign north of the Rhine into Germania. Um, they they are cautious. They take their time. They know how they're going to get lured into traps if they're not careful. Every time the Germans try and trap them in the same way again, they they don't, they don't fall for it, and they just basically grind their way through until they're, they're victorious. Crucially, of course, Augustus decides, and no, all Roman emperors from that point agree. Um, in actual fact, you know what? Conquering a province has got to be worth 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 it financially. It's got to be worth the effort, and maybe in Germania it's a bit too far north. I mean, if you look at Britannia, Britain, that's just within the Roman barrier for being worth the effort. Only just. It's only just. Wild West of the Roman Empire, only just. While Germany is a little bit too far, a little bit across the line. So they think, you know what, it's not worth the effort. And so they therefore um, plonk the northern frontier and start fortifying it along the Rhine. And it stays that way for most of the rest. Well, the rest of the Roman Empire, full stop. It's always interesting to see where Rome kind of draws that line of well that's not worth the effort it's quite it's quite a logical business mind of thinking about things in terms of their returns for themselves if you look at the if you look at throughout the 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 entirety of the roman empire you've got three provinces well one two three four five so uh five provinces i'll lump the last three together in a minute so five provinces which are Marginal. So Britain is marginal, definitely marginal the whole time. The Romans never conquer the far north of Britain. It costs a huge amount of money for the Romans to, to maintain that northern frontier in Britain. Almost certainly not worth the effort ultimately, but they continue until the early 5th century simply because no Roman emperor wants to lose face. The second one's Dacia, which is the Redoubt province north of the Danube. Um, and 
Dacia conquered by Trajan, huge amounts of kudos. Trajan's column is the best example you can see of that. Um, so Dacia, but but Aurelian, uh, the year he died in 276, towards the end of the Christ of the 3rd century, Aurelian is a great, great hard man warrior emperor. He abandoned Dacia because it just wasn't worth the effort. And then you get Trajan, also Trajan, conquering the uh, the Parthians in uh, the AD 110s. So on the back of that, he turned Armenia into a Roman province and then Mesopotamia and then another one called Assyria. But they were abandoned almost immediately after his death. So they're all they're all marginal. The latter three abandoned almost immediately. Um, Dacia, when the first time the political imperative was outweighed by the financial cost of keeping it going. And Britain was always iffy, but kept going until the 5th century. It's interesting to see that play out, but I want to swap to one of those marginal provinces now, Britannia. Uh, you know, Battle of Watling Street, I felt I thought was interesting. Really, really interesting. And, and Boudicca, Boudicca, however people want to pronounce the name, she is one of those, she's one of those characters that kind of looms large in the British historical imagination. You know, she's in primary school education. you kind of reminded of her every time uh, you look at history and Roman history, particularly British Roman history. But why is she an important figure in British or Brita- British Britannia, or Roman Britannia, or British Roman history? The Romans loved. So, firstly, <laughs> to re-emphasise, uh, we know everything we know about Boudicca because of the Romans, because of what the Romans wrote, um, and the Romans loved a good opponent. They loved a good female opponent, actually. So Boudicca is one example. Zenobia the Palmar and Queen is another great example. Um, Cartimandua, who was a Roman ally, the Queen of the Brigantes, is another great example. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Boudicca in particular was very important because Boudicca, if she'd won the final battle against Paulinus, the Battle of Watling Street, which is Chapter 3, I think the Romans will actually have abandoned the province. Uh, there's a link, actually, between the Battle of the Medway, the second chapter, which is when Plautius leads the Claudian invasion in AD 43, which sets up the province. The Battle of the Medway is the first massive major battle the Romans fight, and, and that's a two-day battle, which they nearly lost. If they'd have lost that, I don't think they'd have been a Roman province of Britain. If Boudicca had won in AD 60-61 later, I think the Romans would have abandoned Britain. So there are two tipping points there in those two chapters, two and three, where if history had been different, if you're writing a counterfactual history, which would be an interesting example, uh, an exercise in itself for us, uh, Jackson. In fact, it would be a very good podcast, actually, to do this this to do, to do, to do, to do this book as a podcast, but actually counterfactually what would happen if the result was different. But anyway, that's a different day. Um, if the Romans had lost either of those two battles, the history of Britain would have been completely different and therefore the history of Northwestern Europe. I, I mean, I want to do that podcast now. I'm not going to lie. I really want to do that podcast now. <laughs> but it's it's always interesting to see those tipping points in history and what, what could or couldn't happen if something didn't go someone's way. But, you know, what was she like? As I know it's from a Roman perspective and I'm always very cautious about from Roman history, but what was she like as a person? What was her story and what was happening after the Battle of Medway, that led to this rebellion, this this battle. Well, if, if you, again, if you link the two, uh, something that most people don't realise is the Roman process of conquering Britain was a very, very lengthy affair. Uh, it's nothing like Caesar's conquest of Gaul when he killed a million, enslaved a million out of a population more widely of eight million. So it's no surprise then that ultimately in 52 BC on was the, the Gauls effectively conquered. It becomes part of the world of Rome. Eight years. In fact, six years, actually, if you look at it factually accurately, six years. For Britain, it took almost 40 years for the Romans to settle on the line of the northern border, which later became Hadrian's Wall, the uh, the Tyne Fourth Line. So AD 43, Claudian invasion, Plautus invades. October that year, the Romans have got to Camalodunum and Colchester. The province is declared, but that's only the small southeastern corner of Britain. And then you have campaigns of conquest, which start snaking out from that point through all the way through to the Boudican period, and then later into the 80s, 70s, and 80s with Agricola, who ultimately establishes this northern border. And 
for the first half of that, you're building up to the Boudicca revolt. So at the point Boudicca is rebelling, the north of England is still not part of the world of Rome. The line then, the border is on the line from, say, the, uh, Chester through to the Humber. North of that, you've got the Brigantes, who are a Roman client state probably, but they're not part of the Roman Empire. And the Romans are still at the point when Boudicca revolts, still engaged in Wales, trying to pacify Wales, which they don't fully do until all the way through to Agricola in the 70s and 80s. So th- therefore, you have ostensibly this new province of Britannia, but actually most of it, even within the province of Britannia, is a war zone. So the link between the Battle of the Medway, Plautius winning in AD 43 and forcing his way over ultimately to then get north of the Thames after and then go to Camaludulum, and then Claudius comes over with elephants and then they declare the province uh, created. And then the Boudican Revolt is the Boudican Revolt is almost the end game of the first half of the Roman conquest of Britain. And then it's only after that that they fully start pacifying everything they've conquered outside the southeast and then start looking to the north. So there is actually a direct link, actually. Boudicca is the last time, probably, when the native Britons could have kicked the Romans out, which may have been a driving factor, actually. Boudicca may have been aware of it. And she'd, of course, with her family, the death of her husband, um, been on the receiving end of um, Roman brutality, um, which was, of course, the incendiary spark, which starts sparked the rebellion. And again, to that point about the fact that the whole of the Roman province to that point, up to the line of Chester to the Humber, wasn't fully pacified. You've just got to look at the tribes who joined Boudicca. It's not only the Iceni or Ikeni in the north of Norfolk. As she travelled south, she was joined by all the peoples that she went through. So she was joined by the Trinovantes in Essex. She was joined by the Catavalloni in western Essex and Hertfordshire to the north of London. And then anybody else that she could get involved as well. So actually, the south, and it's interesting, the Kantiaki in Kent didn't join in. So you can see almost the part of Britain, actually, which is only fully pacified at the point, this is AD 60-61, uh, the, the Battle of the Medway and the Plautian invasion for Claudius is AD 43. So you're looking at 17, 18 years. 17, year, 18 years after the conquest, when Paulinus is now fighting in Wales and the Brigantes are a client state in the north, it's only the Cantiaki actually are really, 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 really part of the world of Rome. It's bizarre to see that unification of a Britain against the Romans because it's not something that you know even in schooling education here in the UK it's not something that's just taught you have the Iceni and you have Boudicca and that's that's it you're really taught but you've you've brought that narrative together to kind of include them all which is quite nice to see a unified response to Rome. I was just going to say actually what you, what you tend to find in the Roman the Roman narrative of Britain is it's important to re- remember the Romans never fully conquered the far north of Britain, which we'll touch on later, I dare say. Never fully conquered the far north of Britain. And 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 a lot of that is is because they realised the amount of effort which was required to conquer the main island of Britain. It took so much effort to get the line up to the line of um, Hadrian's Wall um, during the, the time of Agricola uh, and in the build-up to that, that they obviously realised, you know what, there's got to be a a real, real, real reason, which is actually politically imperative, uh, to actually really try and conquer the far north. But at this last battle of Watling Street, what actually, what what actually happens at this battle? It's, the, it's almost the A game Roman Roman um, battle where where Paul Linus is probably at best outnumbered ten to one. Uh, he's very good at choosing. his basically he's in Wales at the time he hears of the Boudican Revolt. By the time he's engaging Boudicca, she's sacked Colchester, which was then the provincial capital. She's about to sack London, and then she goes on to sack St Albans, moving up Watling Street. So Paul Linus just gathers what troops he can uh, and then engages her sort of somewhere down Watling Street, which is the line of the A5. Uh, I, I think it's probably somewhere in Northamptonshire or Leicestershire. And he chooses his battlefield site incredibly well, and he fights an, an amazing A-game battle. He can make sure everything is, is in his favour. And Boudicca just gets absolutely brutal. Boudicca's army gets absolutely brutalised. I think, in actual fact, she loses control of it as they approach the Romans because they think it's going to be an easy victory. And actually, it proves exactly the opposite. They just get butchered. She's dead either through poison or her own wounds quickly afterwards. That's the end of the Boudican Revolt. And actually, you can see the results of it in North Norfolk in the lands of the Ikeni even today. If you go to Venter Isonorum, which is Casus and Tedmans, the modern uh, town, which was the Roman provincial capital, the Civitatis capital of North Norfolk, uh, it's the most undeveloped uh, Roman Civitas capital 
in the Western Europe. Uh, it's got the smallest theatre, Roman theatre, in Western Europe. Uh, many of the plots of land within the town boundary later walls are undeveloped and never used because the population is, is decimated by the Romans. Uh, and for generations, if not centuries afterwards, it's underpopulated. You're, you're making a good point about archaeology and the importance of archaeology in helping learn about the effects of these. You know, why, why is archaeology, why is, how helpful has archaeology and archaeological digs and findings been in helping us learn more about these battles, Watling Street and, and Teutonberg, and the, the ones that we're going to look at later? They're all, it's incredibly important archaeology because without sounding like a crack record, everything we know about the Romans' opponents and the battles the Romans fought about the Romans' opponents, including the Parthians actually, and the Sassanid Persians later, is from a Roman perspective. There's no narrative really, apart from inscriptions in a few cases, um, giving any any sense of what their opponents thought. So archaeology provides you with balance, especially when you're dealing with Roman defeats like Teutoburg Forest, archaeology, especially modern archaeology, which is interrogative and science-based, provides data. And as a historian, you will know and I know, we rely on interpreting hard data all the time. And archaeology, through its science-based approach, provides you with hard data. So it helps balance a pro-Roman narrative. Yeah, unfortunately, we do have to deal with science numbers, which can be quite difficult for, for people who aren't traditionally number-based. But what we can do is use clever people to advise us all their own references. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that line next time. <laughs> yep. So I want to look at one final battle, um, which is yep. the battle. I'm going to I'm going to absolutely butcher this. So I do apologize, Simon. The battle of Carnuntum. Um, Carnuntum, spot on. Oh, there we go. I'll take that. Which was part of the, the Marcomannic Wars. So... Firstly, that's part of a group of wars. What were these these group of wars? So you go through, in, in the mid-2nd century, the Roman Empire is at its height, and the reign of Antoninus Pius is the longest reigning Roman Empire in a period of, with, a, with a period of peace. Uh, and he dies uh, in AD 161, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Ferris become the diarchy, the dual emperors. Uh, and they're faced immediately after a long period of peace with um, conflict. So initially they have to fight... Volgasis II, who's the Parthian king on the eastern frontier, who invades Armenia. Uh, and Lucius Verus actually leads the campaigns against that, that, uh, them, and that's 161 to about 165. And ultimately, the Romans are successful in the, the Roman Parthian war there. But then they start getting the first major incursions of Germans being pressured by Goths, being pressured by Huns coming in from Central Asia. So Germans forcing being forced against the Rhine and Danube. So the Marcomannic Wars last from AD 166 to AD 180. It's a very lengthy series of conflicts. Three are itemised, uh, the First, Second and Third War, but there are conflicts in between them as well, where there's permanent pressure on the northern frontier. And often they, the, the Germans, uh, the ones who are named the Marcomanni and the Quadian, their allies from the east with the Sarmatian uh, Iaziggis, who the Sarmatians are mounted lancers and horse archers. The Germans are fierce, largely foot-based German warriors, punching their way occasionally and often very deep within the Roman uh, provinces south of the Danube. Uh, and the, Marcom the Marcomannic Wars are very, very dangerous for the Romans because at one stage... When you get the Battle of Carnuntum in AD 170, here Balamar, the leader of the Marcomanni Germanic Confederation, actually is very clever. He takes advantage of the fact that uh, Marcus Aurelius himself is leading Roman troops elsewhere on the Danubian front to the east to realise that troops have been stripped away from the western uh, lower Danube frontier where Carnuntum, the legionary fortress, capital of the province of Pannonia Superior, later where Septimius Severus is declared emperor in AD 193. There he realises the Roman troops have been stripped away. So he actually takes advantage and he punches his way over, severely defeats Legio uh, 14 Gemina, which is an elite Roman legion then based at Carnuntum. That's the legion which earlier had played the leading role defeating Boudicca and had earlier played a leading role as part of the Plautin invasion of Britain, a Claudian invasion. So it had fought illustriously at the Battle of the Medway, incredibly well at the 
uh, Battle of Watling Street. Here, it's flattened almost certainly by weight of numbers because it's holding a line with too few troops when an entire German confederation slams over the Roman frontier uh, at Conantum. And then once Balamar is victorious there, I don't think he can believe his luck, actually. And I think suddenly he sees there's no Romans in front of him, so he uses the main Roman trunk roads to head to um, uh, Norica and Raetia, which are the provinces along the Danube to the west of Pannonia Superior, but uh, he also uh, heads south as well, suddenly finds himself in northern Italy over the Alps on the Adriatic. First time that the Romans have faced barbarians entering Italy proper since the Cimbrian Wars, which was at the end of the second century BC. And at the time then, they called it the Cimbrian Terror. So you can imagine the Romans' attitude to this. Oh my God, the barbarians are not only at the gate, they're through it. They're in Italy. Um, this is a really big deal for the Romans, actually. And and um, at the time, the Romans are hobbled because it's on the back of um, the Antonine Plague event. So their, their forces and societies diminished. But also... They're hobbled because the emperor himself, with most of his troops, is fighting on the eastern Danubian frontier. So it takes a lot of time for the Romans to try and get rid of these Germans on the Adriatic, probably over a year in the first Roman force under the um, under the uh, head of the Praetorian Guard leading a hobbled together force, gets wiped out and the head of the Praetorian Guard killed. So actually, this is a, this is a this is a big big crucial moment in Roman military history. Another big defeat. But it's one, actually, which very few people in the modern world have written about because you have to work very hard using primary sources and then latterly new archaeological data to piece it together. So for the first time in the book, I've been able to piece together the data to actually describe this crucial battle in Roman history, another defeat where they lost but they learned from. So it's actually now in my book, Great Battles of Early Imperial Rome, taking its place as one of what, what I think is one of the eight great battles of this first half of the Roman Empire. I certainly, when reading it, I certainly thought that this is such a this is such a moment where Rome just doesn't quite know what to do and how to respond. And Marcus Aurelius just he seems to be well i don't you know i'm i'm lost well well he is because he's got no troops to deploy he's got basically he's that he's, he's he's depleted the, the 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 lower danubian frontier to fight his campaigns in the on the eastern upper danubian frontier so actually it takes him over a year uh through into another campaigning season before he's in a position to actually tackle the um the Marcomani. it's very interesting here jackson actually because one thing that comes out of this narrative of, of, of defeat through to victory is the the, the, the the officers that he turns to to lead the Roman fight back uh, after the event in 171 are actually the, the individuals who then become the great figures for the latter half of um, the second century in Imperial Rome. And these are the key figures, actually, latterly, who then are the individuals who are in the um, year of the five emperors, 193, when ultimately Severus, Septimius Severus, the great Septimius Severus, the greatest warrior emperor, that's for another conversation, Jackson, uh, becomes the emperor at the end of it. So you've got Pertinax, the son of a slave who became the emperor of Rome, subject for one of my earlier books and now available in an audio book. He, he leads the charge. And then alongside him, you've got Clodius Albinus, who uh, in the year of the five emperors, 193, is the governor of Britain and a challenger to Severus. And Pescenius Niger, who, same period, is the governor of Syria and another challenger to Severus. So this is a band of brothers who, on behalf of Marcus Aurelius, lead the charge, ultimately win the Marcomannic Wars, survive the degrading experience of being a leading Roman in the reign of Commodus subsequently when Marcus Aurelius dies in 180 and then um, survive through to become the ma- this band of brothers is, is then at the height of their power in the year of the five emperors when suddenly they're set, set against each other like cats in a sack fighting for the um, fighting for the throne. A band of brothers in 193 turns against each other. I think I think what's interesting about all these these battles is it you know it shows the the kind of response from natives natives for want of a better word to romanization which is the term that you use in your book but also the 
the kind of military industrial complex of Rome. And I think it's quite interesting to see those play that play out across all these battles because obviously I don't want to ruin the other five, but the, how they play out across Rome in these battles in the early imperial period. Two points to make there, both very good, very good observations. Two points to make. One, the Marcomannic Wars is the central feature in uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the great um, epic Roman film in, in, in from from Hollywood before Gladiator, and then Maximus's victory uh, at the beginning of um, Gladiator is actually the defeat of Balamar. Uh, at the end of the Mark, at the end of the first Marcomannic War, uh, Maximus, by the way, Russell Crowe is actually based on Maximianus, who's another one of the Band of Brothers. So he's a contemporary of Pertinax, Clodius Albinus, Pescanius Niger. Now, in in the fall, the, the, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire in the the, the original classic Hollywood movie, um, Balamar is also in that, and the Romans are portrayed as being trying to in, to civilize Germania, Greater Germania in this case, and bring the Marcomanni into the imperial fold. There's no evidence of that. Actually, I think they'd learn the lesson from the Teutoburg Forest campaigns. They basically just went in there, slotted as many people as possible, tried to make the point, and they've refortified the line, Limes. And usually it worked. Sometimes it didn't work afterwards, but usually that worked. I don't think they had any intention of creating a greater Germany north of the Danube. And the first time the Romans could get out of Dacia north of the Danube with Aurelian at the end of the crisis of the third century, they did. It's hard work, cost money. Um, so that that's one. Uh, and, and then secondly, in terms of the Roman military industrial complex, well, the Roman military was the Roman state. In the, Rome, in the Roman world, you have no civil service in the way we see it. The Roman province probably had 80 administrators in Britain for a province of 3.5 million. Today, civil service in a modern Western economy is probably minimum 25% of the population. Um, the Romans didn't have a free market in which they could raise capital to build public buildings and big stuff. And the Romans didn't have um, in, uh, state-run industries in the same way as I grew up, that you had a, the National Coal Board and things like that. So in the Roman period, if you have big stuff needing doing in terms of running the state, uh, building stuff, or running industry, all you have to turn to the military. So never forget the Roman military is the Roman state. Every big Roman building is built by the Roman military, no matter what it is. Even if it's a temple in St. Albans, the people who would have built it aren't local artisans. They're actually, it's the local Roman military who have the experts to do it. If you look at the Roman metalla in Britain, the ragstone quarrying industry, which built Roman Britain in the Medway Valley, that's run by the Roman Navy. It's the Roman military. And if you look at who you turn to when you have only 80 administrators to run a Roman province, let's say Britain, well, the governor and procurator recruit people in from the Roman military called beneficiari, who are usually legionaries or centurions, who are then turned to civilian role, the military, but do a civilian role helping administer the state in some way, shape or form. So the Roman state is the Roman military and vice versa. So in a much, much, much more overt way than in the modern world, the military industrial complex is Rome. It's one and the same. That's an element that's kind of forgotten when we look back on Rome. When you look at the culture, you look at the buildings, you look at everything that still survives today, It's, it's def- the role of the military within that is is forgotten and, and kind of glossed over. Totally agree. If you to, let's pick an example... Uh, based on another one of my idea books, Roman Britain's Lost Legion, plug, 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 but that's about the Lost uh, Legio 9 Hispana. One of the reasons we know it disappeared is because when Hadrian's Wall was built, it was built by the Roman military, and every military unit which was involved, which was every Roman military unit in Britain, including the Classis Britannica fleet, left inscriptions on the sections of wall or forts that they built. AD 122, 23 through to, let's say, AD 127, 28. On that wall, there's no inscription from the 9th Legion, so we know it had gone, at least from Britain by that point, because every other unit, including Legio 2 Augusta, which was based in southeastern Wales, Legio 20 Valeria Victrix, which was based in Chester, they both left inscriptions on the wall, the bits they built, and the regional fleet, and the auxiliary units, uh, but the 9th Legion didn't. So that's a really, really good example, actually, of the Romans, uh, uh, to get a snapshot of the Roman military doing stuff. If it was big and dirty, the Roman military did it. 
I think that's a really nice guide to the role of the military within Roman civilian and civil life, but also a really nice whistle stop of some of the great battles of early Imperial Rome. Now, Simon, I have a final fun question for you, and I know you know how these work now, but recently, if, if anyone follows Simon on Instagram or Twitter, Simon's been everywhere recently. He's he's taken some amazing <laughs> pictures. But what was the most thing, interesting thing that you've seen on some of these trips that you've been on? Brilliant. It's a really brilliant question. Uh, I love. I mean, I spent about a month in Algeria last year doing uh, touring uh, the Roman um, southern frontier, which is a, effectively a mirror image of the northern frontier in Britain. Actually, you can almost see it writ large. But but when you go south of the Aries Mountains, and then you're on the fringe of the Sahara Desert. And then you, f- you you find yourself walking around these bogest like forts on the fringe of the Sahara Desert. They're Roman forts. And that's really, for days afterwards, the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up. Because you're, you're really getting this sort of phrase we use in archaeology, phenomenology, seeing something of the past through the eyes of people who live there, not today. You get this really phenomenological experience. I mean, we, we, one of the forts I went to, we know it was manned by a, le- a unit of um, of uh, auxiliary archers from Syria. You can you imagine what they're thinking? You know, and from the fertile targets of Euphrates Valley, there they are in the Sahara. <laughs> Just getting this sense: Oh my God, what am I doing here for twenty five years? <laughs> you know. Um, that that was just amazing, just getting this sense of the things that are the same about the Roman world but different. Being on the Sahara Fringe, so I think being 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 um, uh, in any of the major Roman sites in Algeria last year, probably a highlight to date. I- interestingly, actually, Jackson, at the uh, next year, the big British Museum exhibition is about the Roman legions, and actually, in the guidebook to the exhibition, they're using one of my photographs from the legionary fortress um, just north of the Aries Mountains at Lambasis, which was the home of Legio III Augusta. Interestingly, of course, in Britain, the home of Legio II Augustus, Caerleon in southeastern Wales. And actually, when you stand in that fort there where the photograph's taken from, you could be standing in Roman York because the layout's exactly the same as a Roman legionary fortress anywhere in the Roman world. Always remember the Romans did the same everywhere they went. So uh, probably in the Roman North Africa recently. And, and that sounds awesome. I think that's that is, that's a really great answer. And, and congratulations for being on the British Museum, uh, having your photograph. The British, I can't speak today. Having your photograph with the British Museum, I think that's I think that's an awesome achievement. So well done, Simon. What, what, one more bit of good news for you. Actually, I can share with you publicly because I've not shared this publicly on a pod before. Oh, awesome. I'm also exceptionally fortunate just to have been become um, a fellow of the. Um, Society of Antiquaries. So, uh, so now I, I now have uh, I'm able to put FSA after my name, and that is a huge honour, huge honour for me, because actually to become that, the people who vote for you are fellow archaeologists. Uh, so I love the fact that you put archaeology at the centre of uh, our conversation earlier, because ar- I can't emphasise to your your listeners enough that one of the key benefits we get as historians in the age in which we live today, looking at people who lived in the past, is our ability to use data from fantastic archaeology, which so helps me and others when we're writing historical narratives. It really provides a balance which otherwise was missing. Well, congratulations, Simon. I think that's that's a remarkable achievement. I do I do totally agree with you. Archaeology is so, so important to to so many historical studies and particularly in the region that you you learn you learn and write about where the sources are just from one people. It, it does give us a little bit more of a balanced view. Can't can't wait to say more next time, Jackson. Oh, I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Now, our listeners will want to, to know where you are, how to interact with you, uh, where to get your new books. Where can they find them? Easiest way is at Simon Elliott Twenty on Twitter. If you just want to interact with me on a regular basis, as you know, Jackson, like you, I post post frequently. I give all my photographs away for free by the way. So when I post on Twitter or any other social media platform, if you want to use my photographs, you can. It's not an issue. Uh, I'm also on Instagram. You can find me easily. And Facebook, you can find me easily. And LinkedIn, you can find me easily. Uh, and then if you want to buy any of my books, etc., I'm on all available online platforms, as you might expect. Um, and if you want to go into any main high street bookshops, I'm in many of those as well. So basically, I'm all over the place, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you want to be. That's how you want to be. You want to be everywhere. So... Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure yeah. a link for your book is in the description below and your social media so people can go and interact with you. So 
guys this has been simon cheers bud. thank you very much for coming on simon i really appreciate it so thank you very much for listening to this latest episode that we just had with simon elliott all about his brand new book great battles of the early roman empire i really hope you enjoyed listening to simon discuss the different battles that we looked at and the importance of archaeology to historical studies now if you enjoyed this episode or any of the other episodes that we produce here at history of jackson please do consider heading to the buy me a coffee profile in the description below or history jackson plus on apple podcasts now next week we've got another exciting episode lined up and i know you're going to enjoy that one just as much as you enjoy this one so i'll speak to you all next week